What does it take to make workshops work? And how can we facilitate collaboration that sticks and leads to results? My name is Miriam Hatnas, and with the Workshops Work podcast, I'm on the mission to find the magic ingredients that make workshops work. Today with me on the show is Lee Kim, and we talk about design thinking, about gardening, and about the responsibilities that come with facilitation. So stay tuned. And by the way, if you don't have pen and paper at hand to take your own notes, why don't you visit workshops.work to download my free one-page summary. And now, enjoy. Hello, Lee, and welcome to the show. Hello, Miriam. I am so happy that you're joining me today in the podcast. After our recent brain date. Uh, I know. Yes, along the Never Done Before Facilitation Festival. And you made me so curious about so many things that you do. And yeah, let's explore. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> yes. And before we go there, I always ask the question, when did you start calling yourself a facilitator? I think 2016, probably around that time. Mm -hmm. So when I first designed my own sessions and I actually had to facilitate that's, you know, before I was just coaching with another person or a group of people. But I think in 2017, I seriously began to design my own sessions, bring others in to coach with me, mainly for design thinking workshops. That's when I first start calling myself main facilitator. <laughs> What is for you the difference between a coach and a facilitator? Being a coach, I don't have too much stress. And, and of course, this is different kind of coach for a uh, design thinking workshop. I'm just responsible for four or five people who are in my group and make sure that they follow the process, make sure that the energy is right, make sure that we do right by the main facilitator. The main facilitator, she not only designed the whole session, at least the ones that I have observed, she designed the whole experience. Mm -hmm. So she's not really looking into each individual. She trusts the coaches fully to make sure that they will do the right thing. But she's the one who makes sure that, you know, walking into the room, do they feel right? While people are going through exercise, are they fully involved? You can feel the energy of the room, not just one group of people. And at the end, the coaches might go home and they are done with their work. For facilitator, I think they do a lot more. So I think about the facilitator as a person who is leading the ship from the dock to the another side and making sure that everybody got on board and everybody safely went through the journey and then they got onto the other side. And the coaches could be one who is responsible for maybe, you know, one section of the ship, making sure that that's taken care of. So, but we all have to work together. You know, I, I don't think I ever worked with a group of people just doing it myself. If I am the only one who's there, there's also another person within the group helping me to make sure that we can get onto the other side. Mm, I love the analogy with the ship, with the onboarding and getting on the other side. What makes a successful experience or journey for you then? I think when I got to the other side, so, you know, of course, it always starts from, from the beginning, but when I got to the other side, And I, I always say, like, are people, are people smiling? Are people reaching out again to say that they are somehow different now than when they got onto the first part? So I don't think it's about what happened within the ship itself. But when you got to the other side, I think you can only measure the success by people reflecting on the things and then coming back. And say like, hey, can we go on to another ride? You know, because mm -hmm. <laughs> that ride was so much fun. And I have struggled with that part of like, you know, once got onto the other side, that then they are, they're done with it. And I was like, but I want to go on to another ride with you. Will you come back? And I think workshop facilitation always leaves me hanging in mm -hmm. some ways that like, oh, we got to the other side of two-day workshop or week workshops, but then I wonder what happened to you. Was the journey meaningful to you? Mm -hmm. 
And that's that's the hard part for me to think about what was a successful workshop versus what was a successful experience that actually transform a person in a small ways or a large ways in, in, in any way possible. Mm. And this makes me wonder, and I had the conversation with a few other guests, where the responsibility of the facilitator, the coach actually ends. Because usually a facilitator is hired for a project, a workshop, a series of workshops, and then as you say, they end. So how can we yeah. ever measure, how can we ever measure the success if we're not part of the aftermath of a, of a workshop? That's the question I think we have to kind of define in the very beginning. Because in the beginning, when I first started, I thought a successful workshop means at the end, everybody leaves the workshop happy. Mm. And that's, you know, that we have done our job. But then I also have seen successful workshop actually leads to many disappointing results because people came in and they have amazing experience and they went back to their work and they're like, well, that's not what I learned at workshop. You know, I thought I could question things. I thought we could collaborate on things. I thought we could push the ideas further, but my work does not allow me to do that. And they get frustrated mm -hmm. and they leave. So workshop was successful, right? You push the boundaries, you ask them to dream big, you ask them to be bold and be open-minded, but that caused the problems because the company or the team actually wasn't ready for it. Mm -hmm. So I think the responsibility lies in the very beginning. What's the, your, your expectation? And actually mm -hmm. said that as, do you know that this one could have a side effect? You know, <laughs> and side effect would be good if you are actually ready to take that on to the next level and say, if you actually give them empowerment, yeah. if you give them the, the way to dream, they will go far. But are you ready for them to thrive? because you might want to just control. And so I think oftentimes I have done that in the, in the very beginning, even recently, that I just go in and did a workshop and not knowing what that has done to others, you know, in a positive ways or negative ways. And that happened because you really didn't set the expectations of the, the team. So I think now if somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, I heard that you do a really amazing workshop. Can you do the same thing for my team? My first question is why? Why do you want to have a workshop? Mm -hmm. Do you want to just have fun, you know, day of, of, of team, teamwork? Then I will lead that. But if you actually have something other, then I think we have to have a different kind of conversation. And that could end the conversation, right? The person say, oh, I didn't think about why. I thought about like, well, that team had a fun. I just want to have fun with my team. And that team changed their mindset. I want this team to have the same. But your leadership is different. You know, the person, that leader had a different expectation for their team than this person that you want me to kind of have a workshop with you. So now I always start with why. What, what's the ultimate goal yeah. of having this workshop? What I hear in this why is that it is in your responsibility to keep the team safe from this negative experience of, experiencing what they could have and then coming back in the reality where they actually cannot? Yeah, I have experienced that in my life. That, like, you know, I have gone through amazing workshops and came back and wanted to do the same thing, you know, especially in design thinking, we talk about empathy. Mm -hmm. So instead of assuming that this is my client's problem, I try to go and talk to them about what is your current problem you're facing? Can we talk about it? And Only until we have the conversation, you know, then, then we can have serious conversations about, well, who is the problem? Who, who is this problem solving for? What are we going to do about this? And it's not about RFPs or, you know, the proposals that they have given to us because that might not be actual problem. But it takes time to go through the empathy phase, uh, mm -hmm. to really have honest dialogue. It takes trust. And many times in consulting world, you don't have the luxury of building the relationship. They, you know, we have billable hours to, to fill out, right? And so I had a problem of, well, I learned to be empathetic and I learned that that is an important part of really creating a meaningful solution. But maybe my team is not ready for it. Maybe my client is not ready for it. Then do I still push for it? And so I think 
really understanding where are you going and where am I going and being aligned in from the very beginning. And if we are different, we can just say, I, I don't think we are ready for each other yet. You know, maybe we'll come back to it later. But I think just to assuming that just because you want this, that we can go through this experience together is not the right way to do it. You might have a good workshop, but I don't think it will be a good experience in the long term. And it sounds as if it could even be then harmful because if you, at the end of the workshop, you have a team of frustrated members who have all these hopes and then cannot apply them, it might even achieve the opposite, that you had a fantastic yeah. workshop and afterwards you just have a bunch of frustrated people around you. Well, at the end, oftentimes you end up with these amazing ideas, mm -hmm. right? Because you push the boundaries, you ask them to really think about outside-the-box ideas and then you already prototype simple ones and you test it you know, for a couple of hours with your colleagues and you're now excited. Yeah. And then the end workshop ends. And now... What do we do with these ideas? Mm -hmm. So if nothing happens to those ideas, and it's okay if nothing happens to ideas, if the intention was that let's just have fun, understand what design thinking is, what agile is, you know, what appreciative inquiry is, what Lego series plays. If, if the intention was to learn the process, it's okay to end at the end of the learning. But if actually the intention was to apply this learning in your daily lives, then you have to follow through. So, I think that's why oftentimes the workshops just end up being idea generator, but not follow through with the implementation. It sounds as if one of the major keys is um, expectation management with the client, but also with the team. Yeah. And with yourself as well. Like, you know, how can you support the team if they need more? Are you willing to bring others in? Because actually after this is probably another person, another another person, maybe it's not, it's a change management person who could do better mm -hmm. in this part, right? So how do you set the expectation for your part? And then mm -hmm. knowing who do you reach out to help out the next part? You might not know it, but at least you can suggest that I think, you know, we are done with the journey that, you know, we, a, a to B is done. I can come back to it later part, but I think you really need to focus on some of the people development here because you know what we have uncovered from this is not the problem is not about building an equipment it's actually about service management then you know let's go through a different ideas on, on that one so i think in a way as a facilitator you have to be also humble like mm -hmm. humble about what you don't know but confident that you could help Not in a way like you you are there, but confident that you are doing the best for your client, right? You, you can reach out. You can make sure that there is a trust built in so that they don't think that you're trying to just sell another ideas, but it's really like trying to figure out the best way forward. And helping them to, to get this mind shift, mindset shift in place, right? Because how you explain the process and the, the risks of the process sounds more like a mindset design thinking as being a mindset or a cultural shift than just a workshop yeah and that's why oftentimes people say design thinking is not just a process it's also a mindset i think if you can embrace the mindset the process comes naturally Design thinking process is quite simple, right? There's five-step process that, or sometimes people do it in three-step process, but it's about exploring mm -hmm. with curiosity, defining the problems, and then building something that's really just to show what your head is telling you to, to show, and then you test it out. So there is this exploration, there is this building certain things, and you're testing it out, and this kind of iterated process of, of doing things. And it, I think, always comes with this humble mindset about, I don't know mm. what you're going through. So could you please tell me that curiosity? that mm -hmm. And then of course, that comes with empathy. And I think without empathy, design thinking does not have as a strong power as it does. Yes, because without empathy, you cannot listen to 
an opposing opinion. You cannot remain curious, although you you might disagree. Yeah, I I have gone through that phase in in such a in such a painful way. Uh, so you know, people ask me like, "How did you get into design thinking?" And it's not me going through like, "Oh, I heard design thinking is transforming the business. Let me go and take a workshop on this one." I, I actually had a very painful personal experience. Uh, when I got into design thinking, it was through a huge fight with my parents. I, so I'm from South Korea, and I came to the U.S. when I finished my high school. And I left home when I was 11 to go to boarding school, so I really did not know my parents that well. I, you know, did not have that much conversation with them. And when I got married and I, you know, went back to Korea, I had a culture shock <laughs> between, <laughs> between me and my parents having this conversation, and we got into a huge fight. And I was so sure that I was right and they were wrong. And that caused a real rift between me and my parents. And they, they disowned me. You know, they said, you're not my daughter anymore. You just are such a stubborn uh, person, does not respect the family. And, um, and, and only when I want, went to design thinking workshop by accident, it wasn't by, by choice. It was just by accident I went. But the question that, you know, my mentor and my friend Tracy asked me, what is empathy? And I thought, like, by definition, I know what empathy is. You know, empathy is putting yourself into somebody else's shoes. And she said, no, empathy is not putting yourself into somebody else's shoes because you could do that many times. But actually, empathy is attempting to understand that person's journey in their shoes. And it's being that person. And that's almost impossible because you could not be that person without living that life, right? So that struck me so hard. That night I went back to the hotel room and I thought about my parents. Before they were my parents, what were they? What was their lives like? What journeys did they take after Korean War growing up in in a war-torn country with nothing? And what about having a child after the first child was stillborn. What did they expect from me? All those kind of things were going through me. And that was my journey, first journey into empathy. Mm -hmm. It was not putting myself into my mother's shoes because I still would be me in her shoes. It was taking me out of the equation and thinking, what was it like to be her? What was it like to be my father? And though totally changed my perception about, wow, my engineering education where I learned about analytical thinking, you know, you, you have weight of a car, you have the, the span of bridge that you have to go across, and how to build a bridge, how to build a car, how to build things based on logic mm. might not be the way to actually repair a relationship or begin a relationship. And I'm not saying that I am, I am very good at empathy. Um, my husband tells me like, hey, I thought you were, you know, your core principle of design thinking is empathy. And I said, I know, I feel your pain. <laughs> and it's just the understanding that like, I would like to understand what it is like to be you. So kind of really letting the person know, can you tell me what it is like to go through your journey because I have no idea mm. and I'm not even going to pretend because you cannot then you begin to ask like oh my mother asked me to buy lipsticks mm -hmm. as a gift you know like packages of lipsticks mm -hmm. from from duty free shop at the airport and I was like I wonder why she asked me to buy that did she really need like eight packages of lipsticks and and then you begin to wonder like oh why oh, she wants to give that to my aunt and my uncle, uncle's wives. And why? Oh, because she wants them to think that Lee is a good daughter, right? So then you begin to think, oh, she wants me to give something that can make her feel proud of who I became. Although I'm not, I would say I'm far from a being a good daughter, but you begin to, you begin to hear the questions beyond written or expressed word that's given to you. Lee, can you do this for me? You begin to ask like, oh, 
I wonder why she asked me that question. Is it, does she really wants to go there or does she just wants to take some time with me? Yeah. And, and that becomes a little bit deeper when you begin to question why people ask that question. Yeah. And it almost sounds as if it's not really about the compassion or understanding the other person's feeling, but really understanding their reasoning behind certain actions. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you might not know it, right? So you go and say, I thought about what you said, um, and this is how I interpreted it. Mm. Can you tell me what you're thinking? You know, when I went back home and apologized to my parents and people ask me like, did they apologize to you? <laughs> you know, isn't this that important? <laughs> when you go to that, that journey of really under trying to understand the other person, you begin to see that the judgment comes far less important than the curiosity. You, you really begin to wonder, I wonder what was it like? I wonder what she was thinking. You keep going. And, and of course, you have to then stop at some point, right? And you have to say like, hey, I'm going to go talk to you now because I have done enough wondering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like curiosity and judgment cannot live together in the same room. Right. Yeah. Once you're, once you judge, then you, your, your curiosity kind of goes out. Yeah. And it sounds as if design thinking was then the silver bullet, according to you, where the shortcomings of design thinking. I think about design thinking as something that we can all embrace to live our lives, but it's not a silver bullet for everything. I'm not, I'm not going to go to, you know, corporates where, where they are thinking about, hey, we have to meet this target by next week. I'm not going to say like, hey, let's have a design thinking workshop because mm. it takes time. I think if you're willing to give something like design thinking a try, you have to have a leadership who believes in human-centered problem solving. If they are driving for solutions, then you cannot really put empathy right there. You, the, Oftentimes, people are already already have solutions in their mind. They just want the confirmation. So I don't think design thinking is a silver bullet for everything. But I think if you want to bring meaningful solution, I think you have to at least consider bringing empathy and co-creation mm -hmm. into the process of whatever you're creating. And it kind of goes with democracy, right? Mm -hmm. You can... <laughs> And, you, and, there, and then it's not, I, I don't think democracy is the solution for everything either. So I, I think about that a lot. Is empathy solution for everything? Is compassion solution for everything? Is love solution for everything? Maybe not. What but I not? think it's the place to start. Yeah. Yeah. The place to start to have empathy or to ask what if not? <laughs> yeah. And, and I have, where I have seen design thinking fail is when you already defined the problem. Mm. You know, you, you already say, like, this is a problem and we have to solve. And in, it sounds like you already have a solution. You just mentioned before that some clients, they have a solution already and they are just looking for a confirmation. Isn't this the red flag for a facilitator and the responsibility of a facilitator we talked before, that in this case, maybe this client doesn't need a workshop? <laughs> Isn't a workshop where the client thinks that he or she already has the solution prone to fail because you're giving false promises to the group? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I have to say that you have to, if you have a luxury to choose your client, you should <laughs> choose your client Mm. And if, maybe even if you don't have luxury to choose your client, you still <laughs> choose your client. Yeah. Because I think it makes a difference if the person is really open to co-creating the solutions together with the people who are in the room. And as they're kind of, you know, involving others in how far they can go with it. That's why I think, you know, I, I was thinking a lot about gardening lately because in the summertime, I have a little plot in my community that I can, I can garden. And I have been thinking about how to involve or how to actually have a conversation 
with potential client in the very beginning when we are kind of talking about the future together. And I have started a conversation with a few people lately saying that, you know, sometimes a good workshop can be harmful because mm-hmm. you just give them a sugar rush and they're mm-hmm. all energized and then they're going to crash. So unless you can manage what happens with energy afterwards, it could be, you know, not the, not the best one that you have done for your team. So let's think about our partnership as a gardening. So let's think about what kind of garden are we going to build? And I'm going to just use my garden as an example. We have about, you know, 10 or 12 plots that each person can take. And the community garden is surrounded by the gate. And there are two gates and there are passwords. And inside of the garden, there is a storage shed. And inside the storage shed, we have tools. Now, just let's use that as a metaphor. What is a password that we can allow people in? You know, there are two gates, right? Mm-hmm. So you can say, and, and you can have the conversation with the partner. Say so maybe one is going to be compassion. Maybe one is going to be openness. Whatever that might be, right? So you acknowledge that whenever you enter into this garden, you are going to be compassionate. You're going to be open. You can change the password when the lock doesn't work anymore. It gets rusty. <laughs> Sometimes it does. And then inside a garden, you have your own plot of land that you can allow your people to, to cultivate. But sometimes if you don't set like this, how do you know this stock plot is mine? Mm-hmm. You don't communicate clearly with everybody else that people think that you are taking over my plot. Then there is, you know, whole bites going over. Mm-hmm. But I think the beauty of community garden is that people are there to help each other. They are not there to take over plots. They're actually there to help each other. And in the summertime, when there is overproduced vegetables, we put aside and we have, these are going to go to the seniors in the neighborhood. But all of those things need guidance, intention, and leadership. And leadership not in a way to dictate what's going to happen, but leadership in a way to set what we could do together to make this better. And I think, you know, I was, I was just doing search through Wikipedia because I really thought about, oh, garden may be the way I can really have people to think about our partnership. And in Wikipedia, the garden is said, the garden, even the wildest one, can be identified by control. And I thought, hmm, I'm not quite sure if I like the word control. <laughs> and I thought maybe it is intention and caring. The control comes with intention. You set the intentions of, I'm going to put wild garden here and I'm going to put you know, any kind of seeds and it's going to grow. But then you have to kind of put a boundary around it. Otherwise, it just becomes overgrown, mass land. So you put boundaries, the space that you dedicate for garden, and then you put care to it, whether it's just to, you know putting more seed every year or really putting some ideas behind. I want some yellow flowers here. And when, when that dies, the next one is going to be, you know, red flowers or whatever. And what happens when the harvest season is over? What do we do to reflect on what happened? So I think there is a beauty in kind of using simple metaphors as a gardening to have a conversation with your partners and we'll see how that goes, you know? Yeah. Hi, this is Andrew. I'm a facilitator and head of customer success at Session Lab, the dynamic workshop planner tool. More than 30,000 facilitators, trainers and coaches use our workshop planner tool and save time and effort in the design process. So how do they do it? Our drag and drop agenda builder makes it easy to transform your ideas into high quality workshops and the timing of your agenda automatically updates when you make changes. You can collaborate in real time with your colleagues and easily share professional looking printouts with your clients. And if you need inspiration, you can check out our library of more than 500 activities and exercises and simply drag the ones you need right into your workshop agenda. So check out Session Lab to save time and effort in your workshop design process. And now get your first two months of Session Lab Pro absolutely free at sessionlab.com forward slash workshops work. I like the analogy of the garden a lot. And I, two thoughts are coming up my head. One is, what is the role of soil? 
And doesn't there also need to be a person who actually understands the soil and what it needs? Because sometimes even the best care and the best intention doesn't lead to a prosperous garden. Right. If you don't understand how the soil interacts with the weather and with the seeds you're planting, it might not work. Or maybe you put too much water or not enough. Yeah. And on the other hand, what is the role of off control? Because they are, how do you call these, um, the bad plants? Um, how do you call them in English? Mauvais herbe in French. Um, the little herbs that you actually don't want to have. Weed? Weed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't you have to control that? And yeah. maybe control can also be protection. Yeah. I love the idea of the, you, you're kind of looking into the materials, you know, like the, the, the soils, the weed, what goes in there. And as a beginning gardener, beginner gardener, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know what goes into the soil, right? So acknowledging that I have no idea what goes into this soil. And in the community, there are always gardeners who are willing to share. And they will tell you, hey, Lee, you know, you have to put some leaves on the, in the wintertime so that they can fertilize at the, you know, in the bottom. And in the spring, we actually bring new soil, fertilized soil, and we all share. So there is a learning cycle happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And... Definitely, like the first, somehow, but sometimes, even if you didn't do anything, the the season is so good that everything works, mm -hmm. right? And then like the a next, workshop, <laughs> yeah, like the workshop. Just sometimes some, it just works. everything worked. You didn't plan anything. You just went in and you just winged it, and everything was good. And sometimes you did at best what you could, and and your crop looks. Like nothing, you know, it just mm -hmm. didn't come out to be. But I think if you look at that as the crop, as your product, mm -hmm. then it is a failure. But if you think like, what have I learned from planting, from bringing, you know, my daughter into the garden and asking her to water and see the worms crawling out? I think if we take the learning as a product, mm -hmm. And you always have something, right? Whether it is good, maybe you didn't learn anything from that good crops because everything worked out. So I would actually think that although it looks like a good year mm -hmm. for you, maybe as a person, as a gardener, if you didn't learn anything, if it just happened by accident and if somebody took care of everything while you're sleeping, mm -hmm. <laughs> then you cannot really guarantee next year will be, will be good. Another thing that happened over this summer, over this weekend, I went to my garden and my garden was bulldozed over. My garden outside of the community garden that was created, I actually created another small one outside of the garden to just to plant flowers and it was bulldozed over. And I was so unhappy. I was like, oh my God, who blows over my garden? And I realized that they were actually putting more soil over to the edge of the garden to grow more. And they didn't, whoever came with the bulldozer did not know there was a garden. So there will be people who will always think that, oh, I can create better ones. And they will just, they have no history behind what was happening. And they will come and they will do what they think is right. And we can see that and then say, oh, my God, I'm so upset. How could that person do it and be really unhappy and, you know, be critical about what happened? Or we can look at it and say, well, I still have my stones. <laughs> I still, so I, what I did this, this uh, Sunday was actually, let me then put a new boundary. It's time for me to actually reestablish my boundary and put, when the spring comes, I'll actually start a new one because, mm. you know, the garden that I had before is destroyed. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that I cannot create a new one. So I put new boundaries, a little bit bigger stones, a little bit taller <laughs> boundaries. And I'm hoping that, you know, the bulldozer person comes, whenever he comes back, he will see that clear boundary and will not go over it. And of course, I have to communicate with my other gardeners to let them know that, When you come next time with a bulldozer, can you just give him a little mm -hmm. bit of hint that there is a garden there? But I think by going through that exercise, like being hurt, 
mm-hmm. of, of like somebody just bulldozing over it. And digging out those stones, I realized that sometimes if you're not there to watch over what happens, it will come back. Whatever it was there before will come back. The weeds will come back. So there is constant evaluation of your own land or your protected land that you just created. Mm. Um, And it reminds me of what you said before with the responsibility to follow up and to actually maintain this mindset that you created in a workshop. It's so easy to create something beautiful. And then if you don't maintain it, if you don't nurture it, It yeah, just be pulled over. And I think that's what you were doing with Never Done Before, because I, you know, I wasn't really involved in, in a lot of things. I didn't really follow, right? Because I don't have any connection to this garden. So I'm just like outsider kind of walking around and seeing what beautiful garden you have, but I haven't bought into it. So mm. but once I maybe see something and then I say, oh, maybe I can plant a little you know, flower on outside of this garden that's not, I didn't pay for it. So now how do you make sure that I can actually be part of this beautiful garden that you created? Because it's, it's kind of, it looks from the outside, it's only for certain people. And how do you make sure that we can communicate? How, mm-hmm. what people ownership. can see from And how can you create ownership and self-responsibility maybe of that? Yeah, yeah. What have you learned about from facilitation about gardening? So I don't think I I learned facilitation about gardening. I think I learned, let me look at this way. I learned facilitation through gardening. Mm. Yeah. So when I look at, now I look at garden and I'm like, oh, I wonder what worked. So in the very beginning, when I was creating that outside boundary, it was barren land. There was nothing there. And I wanted to plant something, but I knew if I just plant seeds and it grows, it will look like weeds just growing. Mm -hmm. So I asked Hannah, who at that time was seven, to paint rocks. And I asked her to do it with me. And we put, you know, be kind, be happy, just simple things with the flowers. And I put those rocks as the boundary. Not all the rocks are painted, but some of them are painted so that when people see it, They're like, oh, a little child did it. And mm-hmm. and somehow I was hoping that if they see that a little child put some time to it, they will be less likely to take it away. <laughs> so what I learned through gardening about facilitation is bring someone or something that others can appreciate mm. that is not so threatening that everybody will say, oh, I want to protect this. And that could be just the simple things like, Maybe people want to have conversation, just one-on-one conversation. If we give that, maybe they will come and they will also protect this land. So what is that little thing that people can look and smile? There might be different things for a lot of people. And what can be the little thing that people want to protect? Yeah. Because they see value and vulnerability maybe in it. Yeah. And so I, I have tried As a new method, when I give one hour workshop for a team, I've been asking them, can I actually meet with each one of your team members for half an hour? And I'll have same conversation with each one of them, but that will give me an understanding of who your team is before I go into that one hour mm-hmm. session. Of course, it's a, it's a great commitment on my part to do that, but I think That's a little surprise that I would like to have. Like when I go into a workshop, I would like to have a little bit of your stories within mm-hmm. me that you and I know that nobody else does. <laughs> uh-huh. How, do you build these stories into the design of your workshop then? Or what do you do with these yeah. stories? Yeah. So depending on what you want from the workshop, the prompt uh, will come with that. So, you know, one of, The recent engagement I did was with a new team who had two new members who joined while we were locked down. So they never met in person. Mm -hmm. And then two people in Europe and then four people in US. And she wanted to kind of understand how people like to communicate because now everything is is remote and how they want to build their culture, Mm -hmm. the team culture. So I thought about 
just asking three simple questions. One is, what does trust mean to you? Mm -hmm. And the second one was, what does human connection mean to you? And then the third one was, what does team mean to you? Mm -hmm. And I asked those three questions to everyone. The way that I asked that question was actually using a visual prompt. I mean, visual answers. Mm -hmm. So I have my friend Chris created this website. It's a, it's a prototype website that I can share with you. It's using Visual Explorer, but it's a virtual Visual Explorer. So she, he created this website with a bunch of photos that mm -hmm. was downloaded on Splash. And I asked a question, what does trust mean to you? And people pick one photo. And then now I have to ask them, why did you pick that photo? And the person says, well, because you see this person is holding on to this person. That's because that person trusts the other. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they pick a photo that a dog is looking at a woman. And he goes, well, obviously the dog trusts the woman because otherwise he wouldn't be that close. And the woman trusts the dog. And, you know, we can go a little bit deeper. Can you tell me a little bit story about the time that you felt trusted? Or, you know, and then you can get more stories out of that one. Oftentimes I find that visual answers goes a lot deeper than what does trust mean to you? And I just give you a verbal answer mm -hmm. because somehow, and there must be a science behind it, our brain actually perceives our answers, not in a verbal, but more in a other sensory way. And you probably know that better than myself. <laughs> no, I, actually, I don't, but I could also imagine that it's just easier to point at an image than to talk about ourselves. Yeah. Because if you ask me what trust means to me, I feel as if I need to share a story about myself yeah. in order to explain what trust means. Right. But if I can point at an image which just visualizes it, I can speak about yeah. the image. So I speak about yeah. myself through the image and it's less vulnerable. Right. Yeah, yeah. So afterwards, I create a collage of all the trust all the human connection and all the team and I share it with the team mm -hmm. and of course within an hour we cannot go through it all but what I asked team lead to do is afterwards why don't you have a conversation amongst yourself to actually learn about each other because I know the story but you don't mm. and thereby they then find a natural way to communicate with each other is this what you're saying that yeah, instead, and of, also, yeah. instead of discussing a process and dis discussing all the tools, whether they want to use Slack or email or Zoom, you incentivize them to talk about the underlying real issues and thereby connect and find a way to communicate? Yeah, the communication is another part that we actually discussed afterwards. So, you know, the first part was if, if this is what trust meant to Miriam, and if this is what trust is to Lee, in order for us to create a culture, how can we use these answers about this is what human connection means to you and me? And how can we all kind of look into this and say, this is ours? Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree on everything, but can we build this as our culture? Communication was an, another one that we actually just read a prompt. We asked people to think about what do you like? And this is, people did not use image to answer. I asked the question during the 30-minute conversation, how do you like to communicate out mm -hmm. and how do you like to receive a communication from others? Mm -hmm. And then we share that. And then at the end, you know, people share their communication styles, that they, what they appreciate, and then kind of coming up with, we like to communicate face-to-face. -face. Of course, that cannot happen. So when it's just to, something to clarify, understand, then have a Zoom call or a team call. If everybody has to agree on certain things, let's write it down, what we agree upon, and then, mm. you know, communicate it through email. So that one was more of like understanding what each person's preference is and then agree upon the next level. But what I really wanted to do was I wanted the team leads to have this human connection going beyond just one hour session. So I asked her before I set, start the session, can you ask your team to send you questions that they would like to learn about each other? And you can, they can, if they have specific questions to a particular person, they can even put a name. I would like to learn about this about Lee. 
And of course, we didn't get to ask all those questions, right? It takes time for seven mm -hmm. people to put those questions. So what I suggested was every Thursday morning when you have your team call, why don't you share answers to one question oh, from yes. all of you so that that becomes a ritual of mm -hmm. learning about each other. And also I, I shared with her that as you're kind of thinking about the future of your team, I also want to grow with you as a facilitator, as you know, what is really important to me is not the first time we met together. It's actually how do we extend our relationships? That's not just about work because I want to grow as a human being with you, you and your team. And what is really important to me is human connection. Mm. So if it just lasts for one hour session and that ends there, that will really make me sad <laughs> because I do value what I have learned from your team. So, and of course, at the end of our session, I asked the team, what would you like to do next? Mm -hmm. You know, so you, you leave with the next step rather than just like, oh, we had a great time. Hope to see you next time. Right. So for me, that, that's the challenging part. How do we extend ourselves to others to share that I care about you and I would like to have meaningful relationship with you? And if that means to go through work and I can still have that relationship with you, Let's have that. And if you can't have working relationship, can you come to my community? And that's why I think this external community is so important because even though you cannot have dedicated time, you still can maintain the relationship and share ideas with that person. And so like, I'm really looking forward to never done before community expand beyond so that you know, I just met with you two weeks ago and I'm having a conversation with you and I had a couple of conversations with others, but I'm looking forward to having this relationship to grow beyond just that 24 hours or, you know, 48 hour sessions that some of us were, were fortunate enough to take part in. Yeah, because there's so much to learn. And I think once As you say, once we have the grain of a connection, because we share a curiosity, an interest, a passion, or a profession, if this holds us together, we already have this predefined trust, and then there's so much to explore. Yeah, and there, are, I mean, I just talked to Bastian today, because, you know, he, he saw the postings on Brain Date, and he saw the topics that I posed were interesting. But I also listened to the podcast. So I had a connection with him and he had a connection with me without even talking to each other. And by talking to him, I learned something that I could actually make it better in my practice, right? So the more connections that we can have where we can learn from each other, we, we can share uh, practices, those connection points becomes so important that, and, and of course, I think the more opportunities we have to connect. It doesn't have to be a one hour conversation, but, you know, just going into your website and kind of listening to podcast mm -hmm. that, that I still consider that as a connection, although it's a one way connection. And if we can do that with our client, so mm -hmm. if we can have our client to like, you know, I'm not there, but can you ask a question that your partners in your team had asked me? And so like, I think, there has to be a way for us to extend our being beyond mm. actually being there and facilitating. It's, yeah, and to come back to your analogy of the gardening, it sounds as if you're planting a seed for something that then can be almost self-sufficient. So you're planting a seed, you're giving them the tools to maintain the garden after you left, and that's... Also related yeah. to the responsibility that we talked about before. Yeah, yeah, and and I think maybe in the beginning they're afraid. Like I don't even know how to use this shovel, so maybe in the beginning we have to kind of do it together mm -hmm. because the person have full capability, but is unsure whether he or she could actually handle it. You can clearly see it 
that that the person is capable of doing it, but that person might not be quite sure about him or herself. Yeah. So once we kind of do it together, co-create it, and then let them know that if you need help, I'll be there. Like we're not going away, you know, to another universe. We're still on this earth. <laughs> you can still reach out. And I think just being available and being respectful mm. is, is super important. Absolutely. I cannot believe that our hour is almost over and I already identified two more topics for follow-up podcasts. One is rituals. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, and the other one is community. And there's yeah. still one open question that I always ask and I'm curious for your answer. What makes a workshop fail? I think when, when we are arrogant, I have done that. <laughs> You know, I think like, oh, of course I can just wing it. You know, I know I know the format. I have like templates that I can I can use and not really do the work that is required as a you know a facilitator that is I think that is at least for me that led to people don't know it. They might still think that it was a great workshop, but you know it as a facilitator. That was not a successful workshop. That was not a successful experience because I didn't give it a, a due care that it required. And if you, if you want to be successful, I think you have to be really intentional about what you're giving. Yes, very true. If someone fell asleep after minute one of our conversation, just woke up <laughs> and doesn't have time to listen to all of this again, What would you like them to take away? I think if they can just stay for 30 seconds, I will say when creating an experience, do it with a clear intention and give it a real care that they deserve because you could actually make a huge difference in that person's life. I have, I have come away with such a change in my life after a workshop, it, it literally changed my life. So I know how important it is. And I know how much care that person gave in designing that workshop. So I think no matter what we do, we should stay really humble about what we do and, and give all we can with clear intention. That's what design is. And that's what a workshop is. Thank you so much for underlying that. I love to say that we can change the world one workshop at a time. And what, yeah. I hear in what you say, it kind of underlines that. Yeah, no, I, I it, yeah. believe that. Yeah, six years ago, I went into a workshop and that changed my life. And now you're changing lives. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lee. Thank you so much, Miriam. It was so much fun. Yes, I think I do have some discovery to do. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to talking more to you about rituals and community. Oh, yeah, definitely. Love, love those two topics. Wonderful. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.work to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.